Chanteu Astea, Nabeci Yusa Pelo. Joseph Marshall Le Machapi, Nasichangu La Cota He Machayelo. My name is Joseph Marshall, and I'm Rosebud Sioux. I was raised in a Lakota family, in a Lakota community that thrived on stories. There were very few radios when I was a boy, and of course, no televisions, and Lakota was the predominant language. Stories were entertainment and education, and they were the mechanism by which the Lakota culture perpetuated itself. The storytellers in my childhood were the grandmothers and grandfathers who had lived life and learned a thing or two from living and from stories. The following six stories are from my book, The Lakota Way, Stories and Lessons for Living. They are about compassion, humility, perseverance, generosity, honor, and love. They are stories about life, and I think they are just as important today as they ever were. Some of our elders like to tell of how our people came up out of a hole in the earth in the Black Hills. That's a creation story. This one I'm about to tell you is a recreation story. And it wouldn't have a good happy ending if there was no compassion in the world. Long ago, the people were living in the land of many lakes. There were many animals in the forest. The lakes were filled with fish of all kinds. The people were strong. There was peace. Life was very good. But there came a particularly hard winter. Snow was deep. All the snow finally melted in June in the moon of ripening berries. Summer brought much rain, and the lakes and rivers began to fill and the rains kept falling. The people knew that the wet season always passed. They waited for the rains to let up, but they didn't. The lakes and rivers filled, overflowed their banks, yet the rains kept falling. The waters rose higher and higher, chasing the people out of their lodges. They found higher ground, but the water kept coming. There was no rest from the flood. The people had to keep moving to the hills and ridges. Even the animals fled from the waters. Food became scarce because the hunters couldn't hunt. There was no dry wood for fires. The people were cold. Soon many became ill with a coughing sickness. Some grew weak and died because there was no medicine to help them. Then the winds came, angry and vengeful. They whipped the floods into a mean-spirited dark being that sought out the people as they tried to flee, dragging them down into its cold darkness. Within days, all but one of the people were dead. A young woman clung to the rocks of a high hill. She had started climbing with a family, but the wind-driven flood had taken them all. Now she was alone and dizzy with grief, waiting to die. Weakened by hunger and sadness, she fell asleep and slept for several days. The winds which had turned the flood into a frenzy also chased away the rain clouds. The sun bathed the land with its healing, soothing warmth. From the high hill, the young woman could see what the flood had done. It had taken her mother and her father and her brother and sister. She was alone. Her plaintive wail of grief rose over the land, causing foreleggers and wingeds to pause and listen. Day after day, night after night, she sat, overcome with grief and loneliness. One afternoon, she awoke to find a great eagle perched on a nearby rock. He was very large with dark brown feathers. She was frightened because she knew the eagle to be a great hunter with powerful talons. But the young woman was drawn to the eagle's soft brown eyes. She waited, sensing there was no danger. Then the eagle spoke. I have seen that you are alone. Yes, 
The flood took my family. It took all of my people. There is only me, and all I have is sadness. It stays with me day and night. Then I will be your friend. Tell me what I can do for you. You can do nothing, she lamented. I will die alone. That is not true. Your relatives, the four-leggeds, the wingeds like me and the crawlers, we are all here. I am the last, she sobbed. So I'm waiting to die. If you die, there will be no more like you on the earth. There will be nothing but emptiness where your kind once lived. You must live. He stretched his wings and rose in the air. Where are you going? she asked. Are you leaving me? Only to bring you food. I will return. And he did, bringing a large fish. I must make a fire, she said. I cannot eat this without cooking it. The eagle, of course, could fly very fast. After several flights to the forest, he had collected a large pile of wood for her. The young woman started a fire and cooked the fish. Even a small bite seemed to give her strength. She could feel it flowing through her. The eagle had been sitting back, but he was afraid of the fire. The eagle brought more wood so she could have a fire through the night and stay warm. In the morning when she awoke, he was gone, but her fire was still smoldering. For a time, he had eased her loneliness, and she was grateful. He returned in the middle of the day, this time with a rabbit. This is a fine day. It is good to be alive. The young woman was glad for the eagle's return. She skinned the rabbit, cooked it, and ate. There is a fine valley, a good place to build a lodge. There is water, and it is sheltered from the wind. Perhaps you should go there, he said. No, she replied. I am here, and I will stay here. I can build a lodge here. The eagle could see that her sadness was great. He had flown far over the lakes and valleys, but he had found no other two-leggeds. She would grow old and die alone. He continued to bring her food and firewood. He would circle over her hill, watching for any danger. She grew stronger with each passing day and began to worry about her appearance. Before the flood, she had been the loveliest young woman in many villages. Now, of course, she was the most beautiful young woman anywhere. One day, she climbed to the very top of her hill. She saw across a wide valley and many lakes. There was beauty all around. But what could she do alone, she wondered. Like any young woman, she had dreamed of marrying a fine young man and having children. He would hunt, and she would keep their lodge, and they would grow old together. Now she was sitting on a hill, a cold, terrible truth within her. She was the last of her kind. What was she to do? She heard the rush of wind under the great wings of an eagle. She marveled at the spread of his mighty wings and the power in them. But he also had a different power, the power to chase away her loneliness. What am I to do, she asked. If only I could fly. I could see what you see from so high. Come, we shall fly. Grab my legs as I rise into the air. She did, and he rose from the hill. She was afraid at first. But as they soared upward, she saw the earth as she had never seen it before. She felt powerful. Trees, lakes, and rivers grew smaller. The earth itself grew larger, and the young woman is humbled by the wondrous sight of it all. She was reluctant to return to the hill. Thank you, she said. I envy what you are. I am your friend, and always shall be. Their friendship became stronger. He brought her food, and she scratched pictures of him on the rocks. Every day she ventured farther from her camp and was soon talking about building a lodge somewhere. The eagle saw that the young woman was smiling more often. Still, he could see sadness in her eyes. One day in late summer, the eagle soared high above the young woman's hill. Autumn was on the way, and winter would not be far behind. Already, cold breezes were coming from the north. The young woman needed to prepare for winter. Or she would perish. He was troubled. Grandfather, he called out, you who are most powerful, why have you not seen to her well-being? I have done so, came back a voice. I have sent you to her. I have helped her, replied the eagle. I can only bring her food. I cannot give her what she truly needs, others of her kind. There is a way, the voice replied. Tell me, grandfather, I will help her in any way I can. You have a kind heart, and you are deserving of your place in the great circle of life. 
said the voice. It would be difficult to lose your place, for that is what must happen if you truly want to help the two-legged. I do not understand, grandfather. To help her, you must become a two-legged. But if you do, you will never ride the winds again. You can never see the earth from above the highest mountains. You can become a two-legged, and as a male and female, you can give to the earth more of her kind, or you can remain as you are. The eagle was very quiet that night as he sat with the young woman. He was troubled. His brown eyes had lost their usual sparkle. Is there something on your mind? she asked. Yes, I must go away. There is much I have to think about. You will return, she asked. I could not bear it if you were lost to me. I will return. No matter what happens, I shall always be your friend. The next day, the young woman climbed to the top of the hill and watched the sky. There were many hawks circling and a few eagles. The next day was the same, and the day after that, she was impatient for his return. The eagle soared higher than he had ever flown and saw more of the earth than he had ever seen. It was a sight he never wanted to forget. Grandfather, I am here. Grandson, the voice replied. You have been troubled for these many days, yet you have made a choice. Yes, said the eagle. I know what I must do. The choice you make is a road you can never turn back from, said the voice. There are still many of my kind. She cannot be the last of her kind. The earth and everything on it would feel the loss. So be it, said the voice. I tell you this. Two legates will find a place in their hearts for your kind. They will hold you high. Summer was ending. The young woman walked the hillside to gather wood for her fire. Now and then she looked up at the sky, but as yet he had not returned. Do you wait for someone? came a voice from behind her. It was a voice she knew very well. He had returned. The young woman turned with a smile, which became a frown. She could see no one. I am here, said the familiar voice. From behind a rock stepped a tall, handsome young man. How can this be, she cried. I thought all of us were taken by the flood. That is true, said the young man. Then where do you come from? From the sky, the young man replied. The young woman was shocked. Yet the voice of the young man was familiar. It was the voice of the eagle, and there was something familiar in those deep brown eyes also. Remember the day we flew together, he asked. I took you up far above the earth. It cannot be, she cried. It is you. I promised I would return, and so I have. Are you not happy to see me? The young woman fell into his embrace. Before that winter, they built a lodge at the edge of a forest, and in time became mother and father to many children, to a new race of two-leggeds. She told the children what their father had been, so they would watch the sky as the great eagles flew. They were, of course, watching their relatives. They taught their children, who taught their children, and so on, to do the same. Perhaps now you can understand why eagle feathers are sacred to us. To this day, we Lakota revere eagles. Each time we see one in the sky, we pause to speak our thanks to those relatives for their compassion. <laughs>